Irene, welcome to the show. How do you define trauma and how does it differ from the mainstream view, would you say? I think that mainstream often hears the word trauma and they think gory, accident, war, um, horrific abuse, which is accurate. We could say that those are big traumas. Um, so I, I, I welcome those definitions because I don't need to, you know, say that's not right. Um, however, in our world of somatic experiencing and even Pat Ogden's, I have no doubt, and, and Kathy Kane, my mentors, we would see trauma as not something in the event, but something that is living within the, the, the person's physiology and not just the nervous system, but in the tissues and the fascia, even in the bone structures, um, in our, how we interact, how we don't interact, all those sorts of things. So it's really more so what's happening in the, in the individual. And is there, the fancy word would be dysregulation mm. within the system. Um, is there, uh, I was just revisiting a quote from Peter the other day, is there a, fix, a fixity, like a, a, an armoring, a, a solidity in the system and nothing can like get through it or penetrate it or is there flow and can there be movement through you know it's like that tsunami thing again you know it's there's movement to that even though it's really big um and so and then we can manipulate that water you know and dams to create power and if you think about that like when you are holding in energies emotions survival stresses you're literally damming up the system and creating toxic energy to use hydroelectric power as another example, right? You're like storing all this stuff inside. And so one would say in our world that someone who is living in survival stress has a lot of stored traumatic stress. So I'm very distinct with the words that I use these days because everyone's throwing out the word trauma, this trauma, that it's like, well, what does that mean? And it's something that is stored in the system and it's basically creating dis-ease, lack of flow, um, congestion, toxicity in the entire system. And sorry, and how that system relates to the environment. Got to bring the environment in as well. Again, very, very interesting. And it reminds me of how you differentiate between personality and individuality and yeah. how the personality is formed could you maybe tell us about that that's one of my favorite things yeah I actually was taught that not through my classical training it was through the work of Edgar Casey, who was kind of a prophet I don't know if you ever came across him um he was actually considered the the grandfather of holistic medicine believe it or not he was a psychic in the United States, born in the late 1800s, and his powers were insane, out of this world. Um, so definitely look him up, his history is amazing, but he distinguished the difference between individuality and personality, and that our personality, and I'm paraphrasing this, is what we create to survive within the context and environment we're living in. And then our individuality is more of, at least in his words, would be the soul. I do believe in a soul, um, that, that it is our unique spark, our unique gift, like who we truly are. And you'll see this in siblings, right? Like you'll have, I don't have siblings, but I see this in my friends, kids and that, or they're same parents, <laughs> fairly same upbringing. And the parents are like, I don't know what's with little Jimmy, but he is completely different than his sister. And we did everything the same, but he's just more this and she is more that. And it's like, where is that coming from? The interesting thing is that so often our individuality, this soul spark gets squashed because we have to fit these little kiddos into a certain box so that they can go to school and do all the things that we're starting to realize maybe aren't so great for the development of the human. Um, and so in that process, we kind of get bleached out of our spark, of our individual spark, but we're really good at our personality, mm -hmm. right? Like I was just listening to a podcast today, a bit of one 
talking about comedians and why are comedians comedians and often you look they have had horrific childhoods you know Robin Williams is a great example um, and they just had so much pain that they had to have this personality of being funny they had to be the joke the 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 clown of the family or the cl class clown as you would call it um, to make sure everybody was having a good time mm. because there was so much underlying stress. But that also comes at a cost because that person might not be necessarily be, be working from their true desire. It's a survival mechanism. And so what happens I see with students and even myself is as you start to become more regulated and you literally <clears throat> peel off these layers, you start to feel things that are like maybe foreign, but often it's like, that's actually who you are, mm -hmm. but you didn't know it because you had so much armor, so many masks. It's like that proverbial onion with the layers. It just never ends. Right. And so the personality, I think we do need it because, you know, I'm not going to go to the grocery store. And if I see someone, I don't, if I see something happening that I don't like, I'm not just going to like scream and, and do what I want to do, which is like save that child that's being verbally abused. You know, I have some social decency, but I feel it, you know, like, so there's, there's some parts I think of our conditioning that keep us somewhat civilized, but then I think, I feel, I kind of know that we need to have a way to return back kind of to that essence if not daily, multiple times a day, so that we don't forget who we are in this world that is asking us to be a certain way all the time. And, you know, one of the, one of the survival mechanisms that I know Pat Ogden talks about more is the fawn response, the fight, flight, freeze, fawn. In our side, it's more advanced, but the fawn in some ways is like a way in which little kids and adults create a personality. Like a little person will change themselves in a home life to make peace, to not get hit, to not be screamed at. And that is a fawning. That is, that is a fawn, that is a stepping back and submitting yourself. Um, and oddly, um, what kids also can do, and I have sadly seen this, is they will get sick. They will get sick because it gives them attention. Mm. It's completely unconscious. But they, but let's say mom is kind of sick or not well or something, or they see their their sibling is is not well. Okay, I have a tummy ache, right? And 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 not to say that sometimes there isn't real tummy aches, but a kid will do everything in their might to stay connected to stay in connection, even if it means undermining their own need for personal freedom and, and real sovereignty. So yeah, that's, that, it's personality and individuality is really cool. There's one book, um, I'll, I'll send it to you. I can't remember the name. It's written by one of the main writers who writes about Edgar Casey's work. And it's actually a workbook on finding your soul's purpose. And there's a whole section on individuality versus personality. And he actually compares Casey's work to Jung. I think it was Jung, Carl Jung, because he was a big um, lover of that Jungian psychology and getting to the root of who we truly are. So essentially the personality is this, this sort of accumulation of adaptive responses that we've built up over the years to fit into our, our family, our culture, our society, our environment. And yeah. this leads to, you know, if, if there's too much of this, it leads to a kind of rigidity in the person where the person sort of gets fixed and they're sort of blocked off and they're very living in their head. But underneath that is what Casey would call the individual the individuality. And whenever we can, I, I think the thing that comes to mind here is that in order, in order for that thing to emerge, there has to be a basic sense of safety. The person has to feel very, very safe in their body and in the environment. And then once that's there, this, the individual can properly emerge. And they say that you need, you need safety for creativity and exploration. You know, that's, you can't really do that from a place of um, 
fight or flight, I suppose. Well, some would disagree with that only because, so there's, it's interesting. Safety is sort of one of these un misunderstood things because safety is often in the context of this nervous system regulation work is one of the things that and happens last. Okay. Especially when you are that kiddo that was brought up in an environment that was just heinous and unsafe and you couldn't be yourself because the, the system, we could even say the cells, it's not even so much the psyche are hanging on for preservation. And um, what occurs as you do this work is you build capacity and you build resiliency and little drops of this nervous system regulation. And you know that because your gut's getting better, your immune system, your movement, da 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 da. Um, but what often ends is finally this feeling of cellular safety. But it takes a lot of trial and error and a lot of time is really the best way I can put it in different circumstances for the cells to finally go, okay, I think we're finally able to let down. And my husband actually is a great example of this. I'm allowed to talk about him. He's also a SE practitioner like I am, but he was raised in like that kind of environment, very, very abusive, toxic, could not be himself. Um, and we've been together for 12 years and it wasn't until about maybe three years ago that he finally felt safe with me in the house. Wow. Now, it's not because I'm being mean and abusive to him, but it's because person in a house means I have to stay on guard because his father was just not the nicest guy. Um, and so whenever there was someone in the house he had to be a little bit on guard. You know, the garage door goes up and he instantly would be like, I can't, I can't listen to my music. I can't do the things I want to do. And so he would change himself. And so it was sort of like a proxy. Someone in the house means I can't fully be who I am. And he knew that it had changed when one day, um, for whatever reason, he decided to lay down in our bedroom, which is right underneath my desk. And I was working and he actually fell asleep, which showed that he wasn't on guard. Normally he couldn't do that. So um, the safety thing is interesting because sometimes it takes time to get to that. But when it happens, a person knows it because their body just has this sense of ease that they've never felt before. But sometimes it takes a little while for that to land. But the thing you said about creativity is interesting because there's a lot of artists that ain't regulated, right? There's a reason why alcohol addiction is huge in the entertainment world because they are driven, they're driving their creativity and their performance with survival stress and they need the substances to come down. They need the stimulants to get them up. But as we know, the longevity doesn't last, mm. you know, so many, you know, think of all the people who die so young, who are just superstars and creative, but when we can have regulation and not be driven with our survival stresses within creativity, then the creativity has longevity, right? Like it's amazing. Someone like Mick Jagger is still out there doing his thing. <laughs> you know? no. When you think about their history, it's like, how is that possible? So I think there's also exceptions. Um, but most people I find, yeah, I don't think many people have experienced creativity that isn't born from true regulation. It's, and here's, what's weird, Niall, is I think when we get more regulated, we might have those creative impulses, but the urge shifts because we're not we're, we're just kind of at peace just doing our daily routines doing our thing I, i'm not sure if this is right or not but this maybe yeah. ties back into the two foundational principles you mentioned at the start particularly the sequencing one you know if we're mm -hmm. gonna if we're gonna work on ourselves we have to do it in, in increments and gradually expose a better way of being to the system over time as opposed mm -hmm. to one big one big shock is that yeah. is that important to keep in mind yeah um I, I don't think it can be said any any other way. Um, increment is a, is a great word because 
it's again, like teaching a child or teaching, um, you know, if you and I were to decide to learn a language that is not our mother tongue, you can't do that. You can't start by reading like Hemingway in a different language. Like you have to, <laughs> it would be completely foreign. Like you need to learn the ABCs, the one, two, threes, the pronunciation, and then you have to practice that. And then you need to be added, add another stress, add another level of complexity, right? If you, like, I, I can say uh, the numbers one to 10 in German and I can, someone will think that I know how to speak German because I can say them so well, because I have I have some Austrian friends. And then like, oh, you must speak German. I'm like, no, I don't speak German, <laughs> but I can pronounce this, those numbers. And so if we think about healing, you need to get those numbers and letters, but then you have to keep adding and adding and adding. And then it just becomes literally additive, cumulative, the, the resiliency, um, the, the robustness, the foundation, the capacity. Um, and what's interesting, because there's a thing right now in the kind of wild west of somatic healing work that's become so popular is that people have mistaken, mistooken, not sure if that's the right word, but they have become confused thinking that nervous system regulation means having a release or having some kind of emotional outlet. That's, that's like the A in the B of the, of the Hemingway book. It's not the full thing. And I think a lot got misinterpreted from Peter's work actually, because he used to talk about deactivating those procedural memories that we talked about at the top of our talk, but that's a piece of it. And, and so part of what happens when you build these foundations and you master the basics of the language of the nervous system is your capacity gets so big, Niall, that, that what I've seen is students will just navigate and move old traumas out, not having to try. Wow. And when that happens, you know that the system is healthy because in the, in the old, you know, when you're young and you're, you're not being, you know, abused and traumatized, a kid knows how to release their, their hurt. They fall off their bike. There's bloody, you know, they're screaming, there's, there's snot and, and, ah, you know, and like, it's like convulsive crying and, that's exactly the right reaction that you should have if you fall off your bike and say break an arm or you scrape open your knee. But in that case, you know, often parents like you're okay, you're okay, stop, 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 get on your bike, get on your bike. And then that kid goes into a shutdown response and they don't feel it anymore. So part of, for me at least, I want my students to not worry about the traumas that they're trying to release. We never ask anyone in our programs, what are your traumas? <laughs> you know, what are your problems? We talk about building capacity. We are literally teaching the language of the nervous system and the somatic physiology so that when they are sitting there um, doing a little bit of a movement practice like yoga or meditation or Tai Chi or whatever, and they feel this little tremor coming through them, or all of a sudden they feel tears, they pull into their data banks of the education they've been taught and they go, this is important. I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna feel this. And I'm not gonna sit still because all of a sudden my body wants to run. I'm gonna do that, right? And so that is kind of in many ways the magic but it isn't magic because what's just happening is the system's just doing what it was designed to do. I don't think people realize how darn conditioned we are to not take care of our bodies. Like it's, it, it goes back to that sabotage thing. Like we don't, we don't eat well. Well, I shouldn't say we don't, I'm generalizing. People don't necessarily start to think about their health until what they get sick. Yeah. It's like, damn it. I should have been eating more of this and that. Now I'm sick or, I put on 10 pounds or 20 pounds, like, why? Wow, oh, I better start exercising. So we've got this very backwards way of taking care of ourselves, whereas animals in the wild, they just kind of do it. You know, um, kids naturally want to move. 
oddly, they naturally want to eat healthy food when they're given it. Um, but then anyway, that the food thing is a whole other conversation. We won't go there. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And I think the thing that really jumped out at me there was just, it seems that the real work is building the capacity to, yes. to process or handle the trauma whenever it comes up within the person. That seems to be the real work. Handle the, the, the old traumas that are stored and also handle all ones that happen moving forward. And, and that's actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's how we start is um, I, I say to folks, and I'll use my classic example. It's a silly example, but when you stub your toe on the kitchen table, that is a perfect opportunity to practice feeling the pain mm -hmm. and being self-aware, not rushing, not saying I'm so stupid or that stupid table or, <clears throat> no, no, that's your, that is the medicine right there and you have a choice to stop and take it in and feel the physiology having a stress response my other example is if like you burn your finger on the toaster it's like don't just mm. keep making your toast like pause wait feel it take care of it put it under water maybe you have to put a band-aid take care of it because what happens is that's an increment that's another drop into the bucket where the nervous system is like oh Irene's actually paying attention to me now. How novel. And then what occurs is the system picks up on that novelty. And then what happens, Niall, is, is then one night, like I said, you're just sitting there doing your thing. And it, it it's, again, I can't show you scientifically how or why this works. I just know it works. The system will start to unravel old stuff because it's tuned into the fact that you're paying attention in the current moment. And that's the part that isn't very glamorous because I'm not saying we're going to go and bake some cathartic shaking movements and do all these things that are ritualistic. I just want you to feel your toe when you stub it or if someone pisses you off, feel your desire to want to like break their neck, you know, <laughs> like these sorts of things. Don't act on it, but feel that impulse, that urge. Tears, tears are coming when you're watching a commercial, just let them come out. Like there's no need to hide them, you know? And so these are all ways that we build these incremental elements to capacity within our system. What you're really saying is that everybody listening to this should go stub their toe and yes. burn their hand <laughs> in the toaster. <laughs> Don't do that folks, we're joking. Don't do right that. that. Don't do that. Um, no. So no. Irene, it's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you. I, yeah. looked, at, I looked at the clock and I was like, an hour had passed i thought it'd been like 20 minutes so i know oh, we've run a bit fine. over so apologies about that before oh, you no, go before you go um we're asking every person we're speaking to this what what are three books that you think that every therapist or practitioner mm. should re should read oh my god <laughs> okay you didn't prep for prep me for this okay definitely um scared sick and scared that's sick. written Scared Sick by Robin Carr Morse. And I apologize because I think there's a co-author, but I can't remember the name. Okay. Scared Sick. And that book is a really lovely breakdown of the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. Okay. Um, so it breaks down kind of the seminal piece of research that let us know treating kids badly isn't good for long-term effects. Mm. Like we gotta, we gotta take care of our children the end of the day if we don't care if we don't take care of our children we're not going to get anywhere with improving humanity so that one is super good um i already mentioned uh the body that keeps the score so we won't count that one um uh gabor mate's book um all of them but for those that work a lot with chronic illness or your clients have that um when the body says no is a must read that really dives into the importance of anger, the emotion anger, and, and that connection to autoimmune and certain cancers. So that's a must read. That was like one of his first books. Um, 
And then if I throw in a book that is less science-y, but has probably the best chapter I've ever read in my life, and I'm not exaggerating, it's Michael Crichton's book, Travels. He was the guy that wrote the Jurassic Park uh, movies. Um, ER, ER was the television series. I don't know if you're too young to know that one. No, I remember it. I remember it. Yeah, yeah, with George Clooney um, back in the day and Anthony Edwards. So the reason I mentioned that one is because he was a medical doctor before he became a Hollywood superstar. And his stories of medical school in the 50s, I think, in Boston are just out of this world. He talks about his travels to, to some places in the world, but then the final chapter, it, it's called The Postscript. And I don't wanna totally give it away, but throughout the book, he, he has a very strong existential crisis around things that he can't prove scientifically, but he knows they're happening. Like he talks about spoon bending parties in LA and talking to a cactus in the desert and just crazy shit. And that the postscript, I can't give it away, but what it basically talks about is how it's so important for us to have an open mind when it comes to the human system and what humans are possible, capable of and our gifts and the spiritual realm and telepathy um, and because of his training as a medical doctor and seeing, like being very scrutinizing, he shifts his mind. He changes his mind about what is possible. And that final chapter is just, I can't read it. Please read, read it, Niall, and let me know when you get to the end of it, because it's super cool how he brings it all in. Mm -hmm. And I like to say to people, we have to be open to things that we can't um, study with a microscope. Um, because everything I've just talked about, there ain't no studies. Like it's, it's just, we, we know, I know based on the evidence from my students that this is changing their lives and we don't have the level of sophistication to, to study it, but it is working. And so that book is just one of my, I read it every now and again, kind of like the Bible, like parts of it. Cause it's just so wow. fun. He's, and he's a great writer, right? He's a, he wrote these movies and tons of other books, science fiction books. So very cool. That that would be that would be another one. Thank yeah. you for that recommendation. That is, I yeah, was not expecting travels. that. That's really cool. Um, yeah. And could you tell us about? So you run a program that's by the time this is released, it'll the your next intake will have already been gone. But you do them regularly. Yeah. Smart, smart body, smart mind. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about yeah. that there as well, Irene? Yeah, so Smart Body, Smart Mind um, is a 12-week curriculum. Uh, we typically run it once a year. Um, sometimes we run it twice a year. So usually we run it mid -feb early March, um, always. Um, and that program is kind of my, my work condensed into those 12 modules or those 12 weeks. Um, it is a blend of high level education through video training um, with me, training calls, um, pre recorded stuff, um, what I call neurosensory exercises, which are my blend of blending the Feldenkrais, the SE, and the somatic practice all together. Um, and it's sort of like a semester, it's like a university semester of nervous system work for you. It's not a certification program. It's for personal learning and development and healing. Um, and it goes from the basics of learning about general awareness, orienting to the environment. And then we get into working with actually the organs of the body. I mentioned the diaphragms a little while ago, the body, the joints of the body, not from a man manipulative sense, but from how you would be worked with if you were to work with a hands-on somatic practitioner trained in what I am trained in. Mm -hmm. um, we work with shame and aggression and anger. It's very comprehensive. And it's one of those programs where when you are a member, you're a member for life. So 
I mean, I'm dating this in September, 2022, we're running it for the 12th time. So we've been doing this for a while. We've had thousands of people go through it. Um, we did just do a scientific study, speaking of science, two years ago, where we put people through um, with a neuroscience lab and we got some positive um, evidence from it. So that's, you know, that's cool. It takes, you know, two years for a science paper to come to fruition. So I'll let you know when that's out. Um, yeah. And it's, it's governed by me and 10 of my staff uh, who are all trained in somatic experiencing. So we have live forums where people can ask questions and get their answers when we're in session. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty solid course. So I recommend that to everyone, um, all ages. I think the oldest we have in there is like 80. Um, wow. And of course, you know, young, young folk too. Um, yeah. So smart body, smart mind. And that was developed because I was in private practice and I was literally knocking my head against the wall because I just wanted to spend hours <clears throat> with my clients teaching them the theory. And that wasn't cost effective for them, time effective for me, um, because I couldn't work with them if they didn't understand what was happening. And so it was that realization that created homework assignments for my private practice clients, audio exercises where I would record tracking, sensing organs, kidneys, adrenals, all of that brainstem, vagus nerve. And then one thing led to another and we just put into a big course. Amazing. So that's Am that's amazing. smart body, smart mind. We'll link to that in the, in the show notes as well. So Irene, yeah. but before you go, I just want to say, you know, what strikes me about the, the work that you're doing here and you've been doing for the past, I don't know, whatever amount of years it's been now, yeah. what, just 10 or 12 on this or? Well, I started studying somatic experiencing in 08. Feldenkrais was 04 and my exercise science stuff was 94. So it's, okay. it's been a 20 years. Quite a while. Okay. So yeah, yeah. What I'm getting at is you're essentially helping people to better regulate their nervous systems. And mm -hmm. this, this is going to become, I think, um, more and more prevalent in society. And what you're, you're contributing to creating a more regulated society, which in turn will be a more compassionate society. People will feel safer and will just look after each other better. So this is so, so important what you're doing. And it's just, it's such a good message to be getting out there. So keep going. Yeah and thank you we're, we're with you on the way you know so thank thanks so you. much for your doing and wish you all the best going forward thanks so much Niall for having me thanks everyone for listening thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed the show if you'd like to hear the full version you can do so with the weekend university premium membership this gets you access to your master library of over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists professors and authors as well as transcripts cpd certification quizzes and unlimited access to the recordings from our annual conferences. For more information, please go to theweekenduniversity.com forward slash membership.